Good morning. Could you uh, take your seats, please? Good morning. Uh, we're, uh, as you know, our, our uh, conference has a number of tracks. Uh, yesterday we were talking about the public domain in uh, cultural policy, art and cultural policy. This morning we're beginning with a discussion of the role of the public domain in science and innovation. Uh, we have a, a, another fabulous panel. Um, uh, we have first, uh, speaking first, Artie Rye. Uh, Professor Rye is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania uh, Law School. She is the author with Rebecca Eisenberg of the Framing Paper uh, for the conference on the uh, public and private in biotech research. Um, that will be, he'll, uh, Artie will be followed by Paul Eulier. Paul is um, co-author with Jerry Reichman of the Framing Paper you heard a portion of yesterday in Jerry's inimitable style. Um, Paul is the director of uh, international Scientific and Technical Information Programs at the National Research Council in Washington, D.C., uh, where he directs uh, policy studies and related activities for the federal government. Um, following Paul, we have uh, Harlan Onsrud. Uh, Harlan is a professor of Spatial Information Science and Engineering at the University of Maine and a research scientist for the National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis. He also chairs the U.S. National Committee on Data for Science and Technology, CODATA. Uh, also, uh, Stephen Berry, a distinguished professor of chemistry at the University of Chicago and home secretary of the National Academy of Sciences. And our moderator, uh, Rochelle Dreyfus, a professor at NYU, well-known intellectual property scholar and author, I believe most recently of a book published by Oxford, is that right? Uh, a wonderful book published by uh, Oxford University With Press. With an article in it by Jerry. But I wasn't going to say that because that would be a <laughs> crass promotion of my colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, R.D. Rye. I want to thank um, Jamie and Jerry and David for putting together such a fabulous conference. It really is one of the most uh, well-run conferences I've attended. Um, the, uh, just a couple of preliminary comments. This is very much a work in progress. In fact, since we submitted the paper for the, the, uh, the collection, we've already made some changes. So um, there are and if you've read the paper, you'll see some of these changes. But in any event, the because it is very much a work in progress, I'd very much appreciate any comments you have. And if any of you has written in this area and we're not aware of you, please please inform me because I would like to know. Um, and then finally, I probably have far too much to say in these 20 minutes, so I will be speaking fast. I hope you'll bear with me. Okay, um, as most of us. Uh, no, basic biological research has, in the last several decades, become the subject of a truly spectacular number of proprietary claims. Some of the reasons for this are quite exogenous to the legal system. Once upon a time, such basic research frankly didn't have much cash value. Now it's the foundation of the pharmaceutical industry, which, as you also know, is a very lucrative enterprise, um, very dominated by patenting. The legal system, though, has done quite a bit to encourage the proprietary frenzy. The Federal Circuit has lowered the so-called utility standard so that even inventions that are useful only for further research can be patentable. Um, it's also opened up the whole area of information technology to patents, and this is becoming more and more important to biopharmaceutical research as biopharmacology becomes a data industry. Software patents, as well as patents on various types of data structures, are becoming central to the biopharmaceutical industry. And in fact, lots of these patent applications have been filed by the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, private firms, as I note, have been quick to seize advantage. They filed uh, patent applications ev of ev on everything, from gene fragments of unknown function and proteins of unknown function to genes and proteins embodied not in their biological form, but as data structures on a chip.
For reasons I'll talk about more in a moment, though, my co-author Becky Eisenberg and I are particularly concerned with how legal change has affected the behavior of institutions that receive public funding to do their research. In this area, the most important influence has been two technology transfer laws that were passed in the early 80s, the Bayh-Dole Act and the Stevenson-Weidler Act. These laws explicitly encourage the patenting of research, including basic research, by publicly funded entities, particularly universities and government agencies. Since the early 80s, when these laws were passed, university patenting activity has increased precipitously. While universities secured only about 250 patents or so per year in 1979, by 1997, that number had increased to almost 2,500. This almost tenfold increase in patenting far outstrips the overall increase in patenting, which is about twofold. And the lion's share of these patents, both in terms of sheer numbers and even more so in terms of licensing revenues, um, are in biomedical research of some sort. So biomedical research has really become a category of science almost apart from other categories because of the amount of money that's flowing in, both through licensing revenues and through joint ventures with industry. Premier uh, universities, uh, research universities, and I don't mean to single any particular university out, but um, Columbia, Stanford, and Berkeley have been studied uh, to some degree, and it's clear that they get anywhere from 65 to 90 percent of their licensing income from biomedical patent licenses, and in dollar figures, this amounts to tens of millions of dollars a year, um, uh, on the average, 40 to 50 million dollars a year of licensing income from biomedical research patents. So. What sorts of patents are universities seeking? Well, they've been constrained by traditional academic norms to some extent. They haven't gone quite as far as the private sector. So for example, they haven't tried to patent gene sequences and protein structures of completely unknown function. But they certainly have patented some very fundamental research. To cite one recent and very prominent example, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF, which is the technology transfer arm of the University of Wisconsin, has an extremely broad patent on primate embryonic stem cells. Because human beings, of course, are primates, this patent covers human embryonic stem cells. In addition, it's important to note that despite all the political controversies surrounding human embryonic stem cells, most of the research that was necessary to get the primate patent, which is the uh, important patent, in fact, all of the research that was necessary to get the primate, primate patent, was at least partially publicly funded. Nevertheless, Worf not only patented this, uh, this set of stem cell lines they came up with, got a very broad patent on it, but they've also licensed the most important therapeutic and diagnostic uses exclusively to one biotech firm, a little, small little biotech firm in Menlo Park called Giron. And now they're, in, they're fighting out exactly how much they licensed and how much they didn't because Worf has gotten a lot of heat for, for licensing exclusively, but um, Still, it, it, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale with respect to university patenting, particularly, as I've said, in the biomedical research area. Now, proprietary activity in academic science extends not only to patented research, but also to unpatented research tools, such as databases, which I know a lot of uh, people on this panel are very concerned about and in, in, in this community generally. Um, other research tools include cell lines, reagents, and the like. Um, private firms impose restrictions on tools when they give them to universities, restrictions like reach through royalty rights and any inventions that might emerge from the research tools, also various types of dissemination restrictions like pre-publication review and so forth. Universities return the favor when they transfer tools to the private sector. They impose some of the same restrictions, you know, tit for tat and all the rest of it. What's most problematic, it seems to me, though, is now even transfers of tools between universities contain some of these problematic restrictions. And by the way, it goes without saying that all these problems would only get worse if research tools like databases are subject to a statutory layer of protection of the sort that Jerry Reichman and Paul Euler are quite concerned about. So why worry? Well. The reasons we're worried are pretty standard, and I'll go through them quickly just for uh, not to bore you um, with the, the standard reasons. Um, the first is the standard deadweight loss concern that attends the creation of all monopoly rights, even when those rights are freely licensed. 
Deadweight loss concerns are particularly acute for public research because obviously the conventional uh, incentive arguments don't apply when research is publicly funded. Um, in addition, the argument that motivated by Dole, which was basically that we need universities to patent research in order to get the research developed because only if uh, private sector companies can get exclusive licenses to the research will they be willing to develop the research further. That argument simply doesn't make sense for discoveries like stem cell lines, for example, that can be disseminated widely without patents and that can serve as the basis for patents further downstream. So it's not as if no one should have an incentive to develop those discoveries because you can get patents further downstream. Uh, second, we have concerns related to monopoly or quasi-monopoly control of basic research platforms. Again, a good example is embryonic stem cell lines. A monopolist is unlikely to see the myriad applications of a research platform like stem cells. And the standard response by some economists is that the monopolist has an incentive to license widely if they have a basic research platform because that'll get them more money. Um, unfortunately, this response is belied by history. These types of licensing negotiations often break down due to inadequate information, strategic behavior, and the like. And breakdowns in negotiations in this context are particularly problematic because it's very hard to, quote, invent around, end quote, research platforms. Even more so in the biological area because we have to take biology to some extent as a given, whereas we might not have to in areas that are purely uh, constructed by human beings. Now, these problems of inadequate information and strategic behavior get only worse if the basic research platform is owned not by one entity but by many different entities. In other words, the rights in the pl platform are fragmented and the follow-on improver has to negotiate with all of these different entities in order to, uh, in order to do their research. And this is the familiar anti-commons problem. A good example of this anti-commons problem in biomedical research is provided by uh, something known as signal nucleotide polymorphisms, which is quite a mouthful, but for short, they go by SNPs. A SNP is a single base locus at which the DNA sequence of individuals differs. SNPs, and particularly SNPs found in coding regions of DNA, have promise as tools for tracking down disease genes and also as tools for predicting individual responses to drugs. And in recent years, biotechnology companies have raced out and found millions of these SNPs and to file patent applications on some of them, and this has prompted concern that rights in this important platform will be balkanized. And one standard response to the anti-commons problem is, well, we'll get patent pools eventually emerging in industry that rely on either informal bartering of some sort or liability rules. Unfortunately, these pools can have exclusionary consequences of their own. Access is usually con uh, conditioned on a significant license fee or on having something to barter in the first instance. And in addition, the historical record with respect to these pools is that they emerge only with difficulty after lots of litigation and often government intervention. We've yet to see anything uh, of the sort, even remotely of the sort, emerge in the biopharmaceutical industry, although I should note that this may change as vertical integration uh, increases in the industry and some of the relevant private players um, as a consequence have interests that are more aligned um, with each other. So what should we do as a response? Well, the most obvious response would be to change the patent statute in some way, or at least to change the interpretation of the patent statute in some way. And in fact, some small changes have occurred, and we would argue that, that these are very good. For example, in response to pressure from the NIH and from the academic science community more generally, the Patent and Trademark Office has issued new utility guidelines to make it clear that patent applications on invention of completely unknown function will not issue. Um, related guidelines on written description indicate that the scope of patents on gene sequences in particular will be relatively narrow. And these recent changes have finally put to rest what is a 10-year-old controversy of whether, on whether gene fragments are going to create a terrible, patents on gene fragments are going to create a terrible anti-commons problem. Uh, another small patent law change, well, perhaps not so small for some people, but it, relatively small in the scheme of things that we think might be helpful would be some sort of codification of a research exemption. Uh, 
We would be wary, though, of major alterations to the patent statute. Patents clearly matter to the biopharmaceutical industry. To a person, you talk to biotechnology entrepreneurs, and they'll insist they need patents on their research platforms in order to develop those platforms in the first instance, and more importantly, to attract risk capital for further development. And there are reasons not to dismiss these concerns completely out of hand, at least. Biopharmacology is becoming an uh, information industry based on data, but its economic structure differs from that of some other information industries, um, and software in particular comes to mind, particularly as one moves downstream. As one moves downstream, research gets quite expensive, and it really can't be done unless you have either public funding or proprietary rights. We've yet to see the biopharmaceutical industry, for example, express any interest in open source development, particularly as things move downstream, as I've indicated. Now, there are circumstances in which particular industry players have put upstream information in the public domain in order to be certain that they'll be able to use this information freely to develop their own downstream proprietary products. That's what happened, for example, in, in the case of the so-called SNP consortium, where pharmaceutical companies fearful that biotech companies would thwart downstream research by accumulating this thicket of upstream SNP patents, got together and said, we're going to preempt your ability to get these patents by putting SNP information in the public domain. And we believe these efforts should be very strongly encouraged, including when necessary with public funding. But for the purposes of patent law change, one might think, well, the existence of these efforts suggests that maybe we could draw a line in the patent statute, and that would be supported even by industry players, and that line would cordon off certain upstream information and say that can't be patentable, whereas you can patent certain downstream information. Unfortunately, what is downstream is very much in the eye of the beholder. And if Congress were to try to draw a line that's a lot more specific than that which already exists, to some extent, the patent statute through the utility requirement, every industry stakeholder would be around trying to convince Congress that their particular inventions were sufficiently downstream to be considered patentable. And the prospect of Congress listening to all these different rent-seeking claims and then trying to draw a line in that context is hardly attractive. Now, when research is publicly funded, however, the situation is quite different. Obviously, no one can claim the patents are necessary or other IPRs are necessary to do the research itself. Bidel, as I mentioned, assumes that patenting and usually exclusive licensing are necessary for dissemination and further development. But as I've noted, that's not always or even generally the case. Again, the example of embryonic stem cells comes to mind. In fairness, though, even with certain publicly funded research tools, there may be contexts in which patenting and exclusive licensing might be useful. For example, patents were useful in developing machines for DNA sequencing into commercially reliable equipment. So the policy challenge is to distinguish publicly funded invention that's best developed through patents or other proprietary rights from invention that is best developed in the public domain. And in an area as complicated and rapidly evolving as biomedical research, this is actually really a formidable task. And we're, we're quite humble at, in even venturing to this area. Um, the decision maker that draws the boundaries should not only be extremely knowledgeable about the relevant research, but also should be motivated to act in the overall public interest. Now, in terms of knowledge, the two obvious alternatives are either the universities that do the research or the agencies that sponsor the research. Because these institutions are probably equally matched in terms of knowledge, the institutional choice comes down to overall motivation to act in the overall public interest. In many respects, the overall public interest should align with the self-interest of universities. Universities reap the rewards of proprietary restrictions, but they also have to pay the cost of circumventing the restrictions imposed by other universities. So they should have some incentive to resist property rights. Unfortunately, there is a serious collective action problem because the immediate prospect of commercial gains from property rights is quite enticing. Serious prisoner's dilemma type problems arise. Now, as we know from the work of Eleanor Ostrom and Larry Lessig and other norm scholars, um, norms can solve collective action problems. And scientific norms of open access to basic research 
have been of some assess assistance in solving the collective action problem. In 1996, for example, leading academic scientists did sign on to a pledge to make raw human genome data publicly available immediately. And that pledge has been followed. In this case, however, we did have also explicit pressure from the NIH making sure that scientists followed through on their pledge. Unfortunately, regimes that have relied wholly on private norms for their enforcement have been a little bit more difficult to maintain. And here the example of something called the Uniform Biological Material Transfer Act is an illuminating one. In 1995, more than 100 universities, including all the major research universities, were signatories to this agreement, the UB UBMTA. UBMTA set up a limited public domain in which universities freely exchange unpatented research materials um, amongst each other for research and educational purposes. Unfortunately, the UM UBMTA has repeatedly been violated. And this is perhaps not surprising because the university technology transfer officers who draft the agreements for transferring biological materials are often evaluated according to the licensing revenue they bring in, so they're motivated to, to act uh, in, in, the, in proprietary ways. Um, and they don't, as not being scientists themselves necessarily, they don't necessarily have any normative commitment to open access. The lesson to be drawn, unfortunately, is that universities and even university scientists can't necessarily be trusted to take sustained collective action in the public interest at least by themselves. And this is where the NIH comes in. The NIH can act in its own self-interest without having to overcome collective action problems. Um, the NIH has interests in keeping transaction costs down because it ultimately pays for all these transaction costs. Um, the NIH's actions can also serve a valuable function in fortifying the position of those in the academy who continue to adhere to norms of open exchange. So the NIH has taken some very important actions to fortify the public domain. I've mentioned their pressure on research scientists to keep raw human data or uh, genome data in the public domain. Uh, the NIH actually did something very similar with SNP research, requiring that people who are funded for SNP research or telling people who are funded for SNP research that they should put their SNP material in the public domain. Ultimately, the need for that was obviated by the SNP consortium. More recently, the NIH has published guidelines on the acquisition and dissemination of research tools that basically say to universities, follow the UBMTA you guys set up. Exchange your research materials that are unpatented freely for research and educational purposes. And the guidelines even go ahead and say, do that for industry, too. Give industry research tools that are unpatented for research and educational purposes. Um, and most recently, the NIH has done something very similar with respect to bioinformatics tools. It's adopted a policy um, of setting up a public library for such bioinformatics tools. Um, so it's been doing quite a bit of work in this regard. And um, we think um, more power to them. The problem right now, though, is the NIH has limited legal authority to enforce what it wants to have done. Um, in the context of unpatented research tools, it can actually do quite a bit because there's no Bayh-Dole problem there. But under Bayh-Dole, actually a sponsoring agency can restrict what a grantee uh, does either in seeking a patent or in what they do with their patent only in so-called exceptional circumstances, quote unquote. And this exceptional circumstances declaration or DEC is subject to a cumbersome administrative appeal process. And so perhaps not surprisingly, the NIH has been very reluctant to use it. In fact, it's almost impossible. I think they've used it once, but it's impossible to get them to admit that they've done it. Um, and in fact, in a recent response from uh, a request from software developers asking NIH to require grantees to make publicly funded software um, available under an open source model, the NIH said, well, we wish we could, but unfortunately there is by dole, so we can't. Um, so just to very briefly, we offer our main suggestion in terms of giving NIH more authority is changing the exceptional circumstances language to give the NIH um, more discretion about determining when patenting would be useful and uh, imposing that upon universities when necessary. 
Now, there are a couple of objections to our proposal that I really don't have time to go into, but I'd um, briefly there basically that would universities turn to private sector funding if the NIH was too forceful um, in saying don't patent? And I think this is a, Rochelle Dreyfus has raised this objection. I think it's a very valuable one. Um, I do think in the biomedical sector, however, institutional links between the NIH and universities are sufficiently tight that at least, in the words of Dan Kahan, quote, gentle nudges by the NIH should not pr produce <coughs> defection on the part of universities. Um, and it, this is also the case because NIH funding in the biomedical area is the most prestigious funding an investigator can have. So in conclusion, uh, give more discretion to research sponsors like the NIH. And a very important co corollary to this is that Research sponsors like the NIH, like the NSF, should actively be on the lookout uh, to fund basic research platforms that might otherwise fall exclusively within the, within the domain of commercial actors. Thanks very much. Before I begin, I'd like to invite you to pick up a short uh, piece of dark satire that I wrote uh, on database protection and the coming intellectual property police. It's out on the, uh, uh, the registration table. It's called uh, An Internet Tale. Uh, yesterday, Jerry Reichman summarized our concerns about the economic and legal uh, assaults on the public domain uh, that uh, are, have been concerned our concern and also reviewed some of the effects uh, on science that we see this having. And then he uh, uh, also introduced our still formative concept of uh, contractually reconstructed public domain for scientific data and databases. Uh, he then magnanimously promised that I would uh, uh, map out the extra extraordinarily rich and diverse uh, commons that exist for scientific data and discuss the underlying economics and provide details of our proposed framework. That was certainly easy for him to say. <laughs> in, in fact, uh, our paper only really begins to scratch the surface of these issues and uh, uh, so I'm afraid that in my rapidly diminishing 20 minutes will we'll hardly do them justice. But uh, having been in the database uh, policy uh, arena for about 10 years now, I'm acutely aware that most people's eyes glaze over whenever uh, the subject of data arises. Yet it is no exaggeration to say that uh, the near complete digitization of data collection, manipulation, and dissemination over the past 30 years or so <laughs> has revolutionized the way we conduct science and do business. <coughs> Every aspect of the natural world, from the nanoscale to the macro scale, all human activities, and indeed every life form, can now be observed and captured as an electronic database. This means that practically all areas of research are now dependent or completely driven by data collection, dissemination, analysis, and transformation of data into new databases and new knowledge. The same is true of most areas of commercial endeavor. So practically everything that is on the internet that is not software is a database, at least as defined by the new sui generis database protection laws that Jerry discussed yesterday. Therefore, any changes in the legal status of data and databases will have very significant effects, not only on research, but also on the entire information economy. And to ignore these changes and to fail to understand their ramifications can only be done at our peril. A central, port, a central point of our thesis is that the public domain in data is vast, complex, and absolutely essential to the progress of science. We have identified three categories, three major categories of public domain data and information in this context. First, uh, information that is not subject to protection under exclusive intellectual property rights. Second, information that qualifies as protectable subject matter under some IP regime, but that is contractually designated as unprotected. And third, otherwise protected information 
that becomes available under statutorily created immunities and exceptions such as fair use. I will focus briefly on the most important aspects in the context of our proposed uh, proposal to contractually reconstruct the public domain. Uh, within the first category of information that is not subject to legal monopolies, we have identified three further subcategories. And these are information that cannot be protected because of its source, information for which the statutory term of protection has expired, and subject matter ineligible for protection or unprotectable components of otherwise protectable subject matter. Although all three of these subcategories are important to science in different ways, it is the information that is unprotectable because of its source that is of greatest interest to our framework. In the United States, all federal government information, including scientific databases, is in the public domain and unprotectable under the Copyright Act. Only superseding countervailing policies and uh, laws, such as national security, privacy, and confidentiality <coughs> considerations, can be used to restrict uh, the public domain status. Similarly, many state open records laws require that information produced by state government entities be in the public domain. The federal government produces by far the largest body of public domain information used in research. It now spends more than $80 billion on research programs, uh, broadly defined, every year. And a significant fraction of that investment results in the production and dissemination of innumerable forms and types of scientific databases. And the bulk of that information automatically enters the public domain year after year with no proprietary restrictions, and with no restrictions on who may access or use it practically anywhere in the world. Much but by no means all of this information is made available through a, a system of government or government-funded uh, data centers, libraries, and archives. The other major source of the public domain in scientific data that is that which is created in the academic and private sectors, typically with government funding, and is expressly designated as unprotected. Such information is made fre freely available for others to use, frequently through deposit in those same government or university data centers or archives. Databases and other information produced in <coughs> academia in not-for-profit institutions or in industry will be presumptively protectable, however, unless the material is expressly pl uh, placed in the public domain. <coughs> the public domain in this case must be actively created rather than passively conferred, as with government information. The norms and practices governing the placement of such information in the public domain tend to be specific to a discipline institution or research program, and very significantly even within the United States. Uh, the factors that will most likely play a role in determining whether data will become available from these non-governmental sources on an open and unrestricted basis include whether the funding source is exclusively governmental or mixed, and the nature of the data being produced including whether the data products are raw or highly processed or ad with added value, whether the research is more on the basic or applied end of the spectrum, whether the data are produced in centralized research facilities with well-established data sharing norms and protocols, or in more distributed individual investigator-driven research, or whether the data are of long-term or only short-term value. The mix of these factors will largely determine whether the data will be placed in the public domain or not. However, it is especially important to understand that scientists in government and academia typically are not driven by the same motivations as their counterparts in industry and publishing. Public interest research is not dependent on the maximization of profits and value to shareholders through the protection of proprietary rights and information. Rather, the motivations of government and not-for-profit scientists <laughs> tend to be based on other factors, such as intellectual curiosity, the creation of new knowledge, peer recognition and career advancement, and promotion of the public interest. These values and goals are best served by the maximum availability and distribution of the research results at the lowest possible cost, with the fewest restrictions on use, 
and uh, with the uh, promotion and reuse of reuse and integration of the fruits of existing results in new research. This innate sharing ethos is supported by the general U.S. government policy of promoting, quote unquote, full and open access to such resources in the government and academic sectors. The policy of full and open access or exchange has been defined in various U.S. government uh, agency and NRC reports uh, as data and information derived from publicly funded research that are made available with as few restrictions as possible on a non-discriminatory basis for no more than the cost of reproduction and distribution. That is the marginal cost of delivery, which on the internet is zero. This policy is promoted by the US government with varying degrees of success in most of our cooperative national and international basic research programs. So no doubt by now you are all thinking that what we have here is a vast conspiracy by a bunch of commie pinko eggheads aided by subversive moles in the federal government to undermine the concept of private property and the American way of life. But in fact, the communica communitarian ethic of most scientists in the public and nonprofit sectors, supported by the commons in scientific data and uh, uh, in scientific data created by law and policy, is not just some neo-socialist aberration in our predominantly private enterprise system. Indeed, there are compelling economic reasons, provided by leading pr practitioners of the dismal science that support the production and dissemination of scientific data, particularly from basic research and from other government or government-funded activities in the public domain. One is the conduct of basic research. Uh, is that the conduct of basic research, as well as the production and dissemination of databases in support of core government agency missions have public good characteristics that make those activities appropriate for the, pub for the public sector. Another is that there are numerous positive externalities, and especially network externalities, that can be realized through the dissemination of public data and information on the internet. Many such benefits are not quantifiable and extend well beyond the economic sphere to include social welfare, education, and democratic governance values. More directly to the point, however, open access to and unrestricted use of scientific data on digital networks provides tremendous advantages to the scientific community itself and to our system of innovation generally. The convergence of digital computing and telecommunications in recent years has spawned entirely new research tools and techniques that have greatly augmented our capacity to innovate. These include collaboratories for the conduct of virtual experiments, data animation and visualization, geographic information systems for the integration of multidisciplinary data on geographically referenced grids, data mining, and massively par parallel computing for large database modeling and analysis, among many others. The successful application of these innovation tools depend on the ability to access and use vast amounts of data at the lowest possible cost and with the fewest restrictions on use. This role of public domain data in our evolving system of innovation is an important topic that Jerry and I plan to uh, expand on as we continue our work. But let me now turn briefly to our proposal for a reconstituted public domain for scientific data. We, subd we subdivide the concept into two broad categories. In the first category, which is what we call a pure public domain environment, Data are deposited or made available openly and with no restrictions on their exploitation. Almost all the data circul circulating here will be either government generated or government funded. In the second category, which is conceived as an impure or hybrid environment, data are deposited or made available conditionally. Here the data disseminator would use a two-tiered structure that would discriminate between for-profit users on a commercial basis and not-for-profit users on a conditional public domain basis. Where no significant proprietary interests come into play, the optimal solution for government-generated data and for data produced by government-funded research is a formally structured archival data center also supported by government. 
As we discuss in our paper, many such data centers have already been formed around large facility, uh, facility class research projects. The first idea we put forward here is to extend this time-tested model to highly distributed research operations conducted by single investigators or teams of investigators. An established example of a data center along these lines is the National Center for Biotechnology Information of the NIH. Uh, the ecological and biodiversity communities are also considering such centers to meet their research data needs. And we believe that other discipline-specific communities could benefit from similar arrangements. This proposal extends the pure public domain concept from its brick, bricks and mortar origins organized around large central research facilities to the outlying suburbs of the scientific enterprise. It is meant to reconcile practice with theory in the sense that most of these investigators are academics uh, funded by government anyway. By overcoming inertia and ensuring that the resulting data are effectively made available to the scientific community as a whole, the social benefits of public funding are more perfectly captured and the sharing ethos is more fully implemented. We note in this connection uh, that many academics have themselves self-organized mini, so-called mini data centers through their websites with public domain functions, limited only by their technical and financial capabilities. Groups of academics can similarly construct more ambitious mini centers with, uh, which could become less elaborate versions of the government data center model. Assuming that financial hurdles can be overcome, digital network technologies coupled with the new legal models create exciting possibilities for constructing totally decentralized or virtual data centers that could facilitate peer-to-peer -peer exchanges of single data products or sets. These exchanges would require the use of some minimalist types of, of general public licenses, and there also would need to be at least some minimal uh, administrative structure. Now, scientists, of course, already accomplish such changes informally among themselves under this norm of full and open data exchange. But the idea here is to better uh, formalize that process and to give it sound legal and organizational framework. The need for this will become especially acute if new sui generis data protection legislation is enacted. This proposal is facilitated by the initial assumption that the relevant data will be deposited or made available unconditionally and without encumbrances or restrictions other than perhaps certain requirements concerning attribution or a form of uh, moral rights. Needless to say, this excludes a large and growing sector of scientific endeavor whose data outputs will not or cannot, for various reasons, be unconditionally deposited in a true commons. For this sector, we propose to contractually construct a less pure version. And we must admit at the outset that U.S. science policy disfavors a two-tiered uh, system of data distribution. While we sympathize with the philosophy behind this position, our six years of focused study on the issues concerning <coughs> legal protection of databases compels us to consider the realities of a growing trend toward two-tiered distributive uh, data activities. As we heard yesterday, European governments have already embarked on a policy of commercial exploitation of publicly generated data and even insist on conditional deposits in various governmental scientific organizations and in cooperative research activities. Some academic scientific communities have recently tried to commercialize biotechnology databases of considerable public research value on a two-tiered basis, while others have succeeded with controversial results. The reality is that the U.S. universities intend to commercialize some of their data and they support minimalist database legislation to this end. <laughs> Conversely, some enlightened private firms and consortia have made their expensive databases conditionally available to the scientific community on favorable terms and such initiatives to maintain access to a scientific commons for nonprofit researchers should be encouraged. Although we recognize that an impure domain of conditionally deposited data uh, is, for many purposes, clearly undesirable, we believe that unless such a zone is set in place with the express goal of preserving access to data for public interest uses, the pressures for privatization and commercialization that we heard about yesterday 
may be carried so far as to subject most public uses to a private ordering under intellectual property rights, adhesion contracts, and technological fences. One should thus conceive of the impure domain as a buffer zone that preserves and expands the social benefits of the commons, despite the pressures to modify scientific data. We also recognize that an impure zone poses administrative complications, costs, and other drawbacks. Clearly, the allowance of restrictions on use breaks up the continuity of data flows across the, uh, across the public and private sectors and necess necessitates burdensome administrative measures and transaction costs to monitor and enforce differentiated uses. It also entails measures to prevent unacceptable leakage between the non-commercial and commercial users, and it may result in charges that exceed the marginal cost of delivery for public interest users. The inescapable conclusion is that the impure domain dilutes the sharing ethos and constitutes an option of last resort. As we read the tea leaves, however, the enclosure movement appears to be ad advancing inexorably. The only way to preserve and reinforce the sharing ethos in science in a new world of increasingly commodified scientific data is to implement this option, but only in certain uh, appropriate circumstances. With these premises in mind, we envision three specific situations in which the desirability of a two-tiered approach needs to be considered. And that is the public sector, the academic environment, and the private sector. And in our article, we suggest that a two-tiered approach is, in fact, undesirable for public sector activities, that it has become a necessary feature in at least some of the academic environment, and that it is highly desirable in private sector undertakings. So we invite you to read the more detailed exposition of our conceptual framework and look forward to getting your comments uh, as we develop it further. Thank you. <coughs> okay, in the few minutes I have, I'd like to share some thoughts on how open access to the research literature might ideally work from an interdisciplinary perspective. My primary interest is actually in the sharing of scientific data sets among potentially hundreds of thousands of data set users using a similar vision, so I need to kind of share this version with this vision with you first. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with at least some of the major specialty collections of full text journal articles that are freely available out there on the web. For instance, right now you can go to the NASA Astrophysics Data System that has about 300,000 online uh, readily accessible full text articles. Uh, Highwire Press has about the same number, but of course they're focused in the biomedicine and life science fields. Then we have ArcZiv at uh, Los Alamos, PubMed Central, et cetera. Now, most of these online archives deal with intellectual property issues on a journal-by-journal -journal negotiation basis, or they have scientists submit original work directly to their particular archive. Now, scientists and graduate students in my research field typically need to access articles and data sets across a broad range of disciplines, including various branches of engineering, computer science, the social sciences, and even the legal literature. So, <laughs> What many, of us, <coughs> what many of us out there would prefer, of course, is the ability to cite across any and all scholarly domains and link from any citation we find on the web to the full text copy of that article on the open web. Now, one approach that's being used to index and access the computer science literature is to search and crawl the entire web. They do this using an algorithmic approach to find citations that are germane to the computer science literature, and then the system allows you to directly link to any full text article that's discovered. So it works on a citation to citation basis, and from my perspective, this is far preferred for indexing and accessing literature across and among scholarly domains. So if you go to the CiteSeer website today, it's also known as Research Index, You'll find about 5 million distinct citations within the computer science literature 
that have been drawn from about 400,000 full text online articles. The system also has some very nice automated tools for sifting the wheat from the chaff. Right? In other words, we're getting at the most uh, cited and respected articles within a specific subdomain that you might have of interest. Now the legal problem with this, is, with this approach is, of course, in obtaining permissions to copy uh, what's now approaching uh, a half million uh, journal articles. You need to actually copy the journal articles that uh, you find in order to test the article against your profile conditions. Then you need to uh, extract and index the citations as well as then host copies of the full text PDF files or postscript files. Okay, now in essence, their solution to the legal problem has, has been to argue there is no legal problem, right? They haven't bothered asking publishers for copyright permissions and no publisher in the computer science community has yet to complain. The system developers have taken the position that number one, they gain at least some legal protection granted to web crawlers by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Two, if publishers or authors don't protect their websites from web crawlers, well, that's your fault. And number three, if you object to our, our web crawler copying any of your articles, we'll be happy to remove those articles, but please protect your website in the future so our crawler isn't likely to pick up your article. Now, Many of the full text articles that the crawlers have copied from websites were of course placed there by the professors and scientists who wrote them. Now, can one assume that these professors retained the copyrights in their published works? Uh, or should one assume that scientists transferred all or a portion of their copyrights to the publisher? Well, if the authors of course did, trans and, and of course that's very common, um, uh, in my field uh, or, or throughout this literature base, if authors did transfer their rights to publishers, does that mean that Sightseer is acting similar to a Napster for the computer science literature? After all, it's a facility that contributes to the illegal sharing of copyrighted articles among scientists. Right? However, unlike Napster, the original authors or quote talent uh, aren't complaining. <laughs> Uh, they're not losing any money since scientists typically aren't into publishing their articles for direct compensation. Further, unlike Nabster, many of the leading publishers in the computer science communi community are member organizations whose members would rise up in revolt if their professional organization objected to this particular system. Now, I have to tell you, this is an extremely valuable resource and it's used by thousands and thousands of scientists every day. Um, now, while you and I might go and run to Google to do a search, my graduate students and the other professors that I work with, they typically run first to Sightseer to do uh, their general search for the literature. As a matter of fact, they'll always check Sightseer before resorting to the commercial online databases that the university is actually paying money to subscribe to. Um, I talked. Uh, actually, I called up one of the people here involved in this, uh, Lee Giles at Penn State, uh, who's one of the uh, people that set this crawler running, uh, which, which, by the way, started as a side assignment to one of his graduate students during the summer um, to find some articles on the web uh, because they figured, well, these, somebody's got to be writing on this. They couldn't find these articles through the normal channels. So I said, well, write some code and we'll, we'll crawl the other leading uh, computer science departments and we'll kind of do a, I don't know, shepherdizing kind of back in time if the people still use that term, I don't know. But uh, uh, anyway, going back in time to find, and lo and behold, the, cold, the, the uh, uh, code actually worked. They found what they wanted and then they started to use it for broader and broader searches. So there was no grand scheme to create this capability. It's just kind of evolved over time as various people have found it useful, uh, as people have kind of improved, improved the code over time and, and they simply let the thing continue to run. Um, now Lee says he's been absolutely flabbergasted by the social effects of this thing, right? With five million citations, you can, you can now ask questions like, well, who is the most cited person across all of the modern computer science literature, right? You can come up, you can come to a conference like this and you can know the general citation ranking of every person in the room. <laughs> um, 
who has the most cited article addressing a topic, you know, such as the public domain? Who has, uh, which journal is the most influential on the topic? Who has the most cited article in the most re respected journal? Who has the most cited article in the second uh, most respected journal? And it goes on and on, and that's what the computer science community is doing right now. They're, they're going through this uh, whole, whole situation. You can compare the citation records of those articles that are available online with those that aren't available online, and you discover that you're four and a half times more likely to be cited if your articles are openly available online. Okay, so there's just a, a recent article in Nature on this. So professors are now actively shipping in the URLs where their articles may be found so the crawler can pick up their missing full text articles, right? So if you're an academic, What's your goal in life? Well, it's to be cited, right? <laughs> it's, it's to be recognized as an authority in your field. It's to know that your work matters. So the system has created a dynamic of professors actually making certain that all their articles are out there and available uh, on the web, okay? So are private scientific publishers complaining about this situation? Well, so far they haven't been. And my guess is they're not likely to do so unless they want to be completely boycotted by the general computer science community. Uh, still, I'm surprised that certain European science publishers haven't, you know, sent over at least one uh, plane load of, uh, of lawyers to challenge the system. Um, I also ponder whether the scholarly community reactions would be the same if a crawler was currently indexing and copying all openly available law review articles, or if there was a crawler out there currently searching, crawling, copying all of the uh, uh, biology articles. Well, let's assume you're in one of these other scholarly domains, but you want to solve the legal uh, dilemma for your own discipline. How would you go about doing that? Well, in my case, uh, I'd set up a website, and in my, again, in my case, I'd call it the Public Library of Geographic Information Science, and we've actually set up a mock site like this, um, and of course eventually I'd want it hosted not by me but by some university consortium within my particular discipline and they, they do exist. So on this website that I have right now, the library has four components, right? Number one, open access to the GI science uh, literature. Number two, open access to GI science course materials. On that topic, um, like me, I, uh, I assume that all you cyber lawyer professors are, cyber law professors are openly web streaming your class lectures to the world. After all, building the public domain starts at home. So that's a hint, right? Uh, the third component is public comments for geographic data. The fourth is open source GIS software. So again, let me focus on this literature uh, stream first. Our basic rule in designing this online material is to keep it very, very simple for scientists, right? So in a single paragraph, we tell them what's wrong with the current publishing paradigm, which they all know anyway. In the second, we present a solution. And then third, we walk them through four steps that solve all of their journal copyright and access problems, right? So step one in that list is titled Submitting Articles to Journals. So it says, in submitting your work to a scientific journal for peer review, we recommend that you place the following notice on your work prior to submission. This work, entitled whatever, is distributed under the terms of the Public Library of Science Open Access License. And of course, that license essentially says anyone can copy this article for free as long as attribution is given. Thus, we provide one, uh, well, and then we provide one optional statement. Although this license is in effect immediately and irrevocably, the authors agree to not make the article available to any publicly accessible archive until it's first been published or it's been withdrawn from publication. Now, notice that here we're, we're giving one and only one recommendation, right? We don't give them a whole suite of open access licenses to choose from. Most research uh, scientists and engineers could care less about analyzing the law and social policy. They just want one best shot uh, at supplying a legal solution for them. So we've gone back kind of to, to Jessica's 25 years ago, instead of putting the C there, okay, put this standard 25 words on your document, and uh, we'll, we'll have to go through that formality to make this thing work for us. Step two, which journals will publish articles subject to prior rights to the public existing in the article? Well, ultimately, I think all the journals in my discipline are, are going to come around. Um, 
However, the solution to speed that process up is not to go big these journals in your discipline to accept an open access license. What you do is you go out to your community and you say, okay, here are all the journals that you're publishing in, here's the long list. Report back your experiences when you try to use an open access license. Is it, is it plus or minus in these instances? And then we simply publicize that on the website. Those journals that allow open access licenses will have a substantial competitive advantage in attracting submissions, particularly when most scientists discover that they're four times as likely to be cited by other scientists as long as, it's, as, long as their articles are in the open. Now, step three, once published, how can I, I ensure that my articles will be, be found by others through a widely accessible citation index this indexing system? Well, here, you know, in our instance, we'd lead them to sites here. Uh, but the problem here, again, for my, let's say, GI science discipline is that our scientists publish across a broad range of literature, not just the computer science literature. Therefore, we either need to, to set up a sites here capability with algorithms and keywords developed for our specific domain, or hope that someone comes along to scale up Sightseer to cover all scientific literature on the web. Okay, the last step, uh, once published, how can I ensure that my article is maintained in a long-term public electronic archive in addition, in addition to sitting on a server at my university or simply on the server of my publisher? Of course, I think everybody in this room knows that there is no longer a default right to archive in this world of electronic uh, licensing that, that we're in. Well, again, scientists can overcome that particular impediment by using this uh, open access license approach. All right, as I said, I'm running through this fast because the numbers keep popping up here, but uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, my primary interest is actually in developing a public commons of geographic data. I think the challenges in that instance are far greater than for open access sharing of journal articles, particularly if the vision is one of hundreds of thousands of people creating spatial data sets, which is actually what's happening out there in your communities uh, among all scientific disciplines. Uh, so the people are creating these data sets, but now how do we uh, incentivize them for generating the metadata for those works and then bringing them into an open sharing uh, environment as I've, I've kind of laid out. Uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to the continuing discussion. I'm going to try to pick up uh, immediately from a point from uh, what Harlan was dis discussing, uh, there is uh, on the internet, uh, on the web, a set of essays from a study that was done under the auspices of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, the it, title is The Transition from Paper. It's been up there for now almost two years, and basically uh, it centers around uh, a uh, around potential visions of electronic communication in the sciences uh, 20 to 30 years hence. Uh, and one of the central issues is the concept of a giant global archive which would serve just exactly the function that you were describing. Uh, this is, uh, I, I didn't, although I intended to, didn't bring the URL, but it's the American Academy of Arts and Sciences webpage, and it's called The Transition from Paper. Um, so your uh, search engine will, will find it immediately. Uh, now, I'm uh, going to try to make a series of comments which I hope are adequately outrageous um, for, uh, for this audience. Uh, some of these are simply looking at points we've already discussed and stepping back a bit uh, and some are, are very specific to some of the uh, comments we've, we've had before. Uh, let me begin by talking about this whole question of the uh, investment of government funds uh, for research. We have to ask, why is this done? And the justification is a very easy one from the viewpoint of, of an economic analysis. That is, 
governments use public funds for supporting research because that research produces public goods, goods that do not diminish in value with use uh, and that uh, have broad uh, benefits, widely distributed benefits, that uh, often cannot be captured in any simple way. Now, scientific results have a special character in that context because their value not only doesn't diminish but is enhanced by use. The value of scientific work goes up with the, uh, with the number of citations <laughs> and, and uses. Consequently, we can infer that any action which inhibits the spread of the information from scientific results is acting counter to the intentions of the supplying government. Now, this is certainly in direct opposition to uh, some of the concepts underlying by Dole, but it's an inevitable logic that you, you must not inhibit in order to stay consistent with the intentions of the, of the supplying government, you must not inhibit the distribution of that information. Let me move on to the uh, EU database directive. Now, that directive specifically allows monopolistic inhibition of that goal for the purposes of uh, private profit for the first taker. Now, let me just generalize that concept a little bit. Here is publicly supported public good, which the EU directive says is available to privatize to the first taker. Let me pursue that logic one step further. I can go to the Lincoln Memorial, nobody else has done it yet, and I can put up a toll gate and I can make you pay because I'm first. I thought of it before anybody else. And that is exactly what the EU directive is doing. Now, uh, we can distinguish here between the, uh, the goods that can be, by the way, Jerry, I like your word commoditize rather than commodify. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can justify making commodities of, of these otherwise public goods provided that giving a monopoly to one holder does not exclude some other competitive product that another holder could introduce. What we cannot tolerate is privatizing the a good which can have no competitor. This is a kind of monopolization that is intolerable even to Milton Friedman. The, the, the one area in which he said regulation is justified is that kind of monopolization. We must not allow the destruction of a market. And that is exactly what happens if you allow privatization of a good which has no competitor. Databases are essentially of that kind. Incidentally, I should also interject, I am really puzzled that there has been no challenge uh, to the privatization of court records in the cases where the states have then destroyed or failed to maintain their own separate records. This, it seems to me, is precisely the kind of privatization that destroys markets and that we should really be very, very worried about. Uh, now, we do have examples that uh, m turning data into commodities can be done successfully in ways that are completely compatible with copyright and uh, non-monopolies. Uh, two examples, the Journal of Physical and Chemical Reference Data, which <laughs> essentially converts uh, unscrutinized data into evaluated data and clearly gives a much greater 
value to the data, and it's a very, very successful journal. The Handbook of Chemical, uh, Chemistry and Physics doesn't do evaluations, but it provides a compilation that is unique enough to justify copyright. Um, let me jump to another topic that was, I think, in the background of our discussion yesterday. Uh, in the context of the uh, university industry relations and the, the kinds of restrictions that we are seeing uh, growing through these agreements. I think it's very important that we bring the universities back to recognize their primary function and primary products. Their primary products are people, not research products. We use research as a way of training people, and secondarily, those of us who do research in universities also have our own personal benefits from these things, but the universities have to realize that restricting communication among students inhibits the process of training the people that are their primary product. Um, I'd like to comment on uh, the uh, a point that, that, that Paul mentioned and that, uh, that Mark Hauser, uh brought up yesterday, once more, uh, that scientists and I believe artists share a common sense of purpose in terms of the goals and values of propagating their work. That is, their primary interest is to influence the thinking of other people. If they are successful at that, then they will uh, become financially successful, but they are not primarily trying to sell paintings or sell articles. And I think that the, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act has uh, changed, and I am sometimes tempted to say corroded, the value system that has been at the basis of the the enormously productive basic research uh, enterprise of the United States that has led to the commercial prosperity that we have now. Uh, well, I think uh, I will close with, uh, with that. Thank you. I've been asked to come here uh, to give a comment and also to moderate, and I think we have started 10 minutes late, so I assume we have an extra 10 minutes or 15 minutes so that we can uh, have questions and answers of everybody at the end. Um, I hope that when I was asked to comment, it was not to fill the same role as Carrie Sherman uh, to provide balance, <laughs> because uh, my comments are mainly directed at Artie and Becky's paper, and I agree with virtually every single thing that Artie said in it, uh, so I will really be flopping on that count. Um, uh, I think that she and Becky made it very clear that the public domain of science has been hit by something of a double whammy. Not only has it experienced the forces we discussed yesterday, forces that expand the domain of private ownership, but the Bayh-Dole Act has also created a whole new class of private owners. Uh, actually, I think that extending ownership to universities would not have been all that bad had a tra the traditional distinction between research uses and end uses remained viable. It was once the case that research uses were not considered patentable and end uses were. Uh, had that remained viable, universities would have continued producing public knowledge uh, while the Bayh-Dole Act would have operated at the margin using patents to protect investments in commercialization. Who was to know in 1980 just how blurred that distinction would become? Uh, nonetheless, it's hard to understand why the potential problems with Bayh-Dole weren't easier to spot in advance. First, the idea of using patents to shelter commercialization, uh, well, that's not really the kind of work that patent law was supposed to do, and thus it's no surprise that universities quickly began to focus on patenting the creative parts of what they were doing. Uh, indeed, another sorry byproduct of Bayh-Dole is that I think if you look at the cases, you'll see that universities have actually been taking a lead in encouraging enclosure and in pushing private rights upstream. Second, um, although Becky and Artie say that the Bayh-Dole Act was not intended to generate revenue for universities, I think most observers didn't see it that way, and we should not be surprised that since 1980, 
federal funding of R&D has decreased something like 50 percent. Uh, that tells me that Congress didn't see things that way either. Uh, so it's no wonder that universities act so much like IP entrepreneurs. Uh, in fact, they need the money. And here I'll make one small comment on Jerry and uh, Paul's paper, and it echoes something that already said, too. Uh, there really are limits on how far one can draw on the open source movement. Writing computer code is incremental. It is, for the most part, a low-cost activity. In contrast, doing modern science can require massive amounts of monetary support, and that money does have to come from somewhere. So I know that Paul and Jerry are ashamed of their impure zone, but I think it's actually quite necessary to make sure that there are enough funds uh, for doing certain kinds of science. That said, I also think that there's a little bit of a yes minister quality going on in universities. If you don't know it, Yes Minister is a BBC program about James Hacker MP who's constantly being outmaneuvered by his permanent secretary, Sir Humphrey Appleby. Uh, the program shows the civil servants as basically running parliament, and it does that for good reason. They're the repeat players. Uh, the ministers aren't professional managers, and their portfolios are, of course, temporaries. And to some extent, universities are run just like that. Presidents and deans are drawn from the faculty. They're not professional managers, and they, too, serve tem temporarily. Who's there all the time, the Sir Humphrey Applebee's of the piece, are the technology transfer officers, and so it's mainly through their eyes that these issues are now evaluated. So while I think there was, at the time that Baidol first went into effect, a generation of university administrators who saw all of the dangers um, that Stephen Berry just told us about and dealt with the Baidol Act rather gingerly, that crowd is long gone. Uh, the current crop is thrilled with the money that patent rights are generating, and they aren't about to just walk away from that money or, indeed, allow their faculty to walk away from it for them. Um, so that's the problem. Now, what's the solution? There are two things I very much like about what Becky and Artie propose, and I would urge them to go further with each of them. First, there, there's their idea of looking for institutional players who are inherently better motivated to reach the right decisions. I've written about that kind of institutional substitution in other contexts, and I think Artie and Becky make a terrific case for using it here. Um, but I do have one concern. When Artie and Becky tell me that NIH can take on this role, I do believe them. They really know that agency. But there are other agencies that fund research that are subject to the Bayh-Dole Act, and I'm not sure all of the others would do as well with that sort of freewheeling discretion uh, that they recommend. I've interacted with Departments of Defense and Energy in connection with some work on the Price-Anderson Act, and at that time, both agencies, the DOE especially, was pretty committed to government control, not public access, government control of the fruits of publicly funded research. And in fact, I'm under the impression that the cumbersome procedures and high standards that you see in the act right now were actually instituted because DOE was so famously reluctant to give control to its research partners or for that matter, to anybody else. And now, admittedly, that was quite a while ago, and by now, agencies are more familiar with Baidol, but I'm still concerned, and actually, since September 11th, even more concerned. More agencies are about to get involved in biological research. The areas of research that the government's interested in will, are sure to expand, and September 11th also means it will be easier to claim that circumstances are exceptional, or whatever watered-down standard you have, more, even more certainly. So I think that there's some that their proposal really could use uh, some guidelines. For one, make it clear that the agency's choice is there to increase public access, not secrecy. Second, explain the proposal's application outside the biotechnology context. Just like it's bad to analogize from open source to biotech, I'm not so sure it's, you really have to think about analogizing from biotech to other contexts. A third, consider other institutional players. Uh, Harlan gave us an interesting story about putting influence on journals. The reverse might also be true. Journals could require uh, some access as a condition of uh, publication. Fourth, uh, I wish you'd say a little bit more about the kinds of inventions that should be subject to the new approach. Uh, as to that, I'm a little confused by the paper. Part of it indicates that the problem you're trying to address is the anti-commons slash thicket problem of multiple users. Uh, but then you say that patent pools may be correcting that, so I'm not sure that's really where you're directed. Uh, another part of the paper uh, hints that the issue may be with very upstream uh, inventions, 
And indeed, there is uh, quite a bit of empirical work starting to develop that there are bottlenecks there. There's a recent study by Wesley Cohn that me and I think several other people in the rooms, including you, heard him present, uh, that's found that general purpose research tools were not creating obstacles to research to any large degree, but that certain upstream inventions, principally biological targets like information uh, about receptors on cells, were extremely problematic that owners of targets regard research opportunities presented by their targets as very much a part of their patent reward, and they don't tend to license them at all. So it's perhaps these kinds of really upstream inventions that are at the heart of your proposal. Uh, but if that's the case, there's a problem there too. There's a problem with making a cut based solely on whether it's upstream or downstream, and I know you recognize this. Uh, it can be hard to tell at the time that funding agreements are negotiated just how fundamental the re resulting research might actually be. So I'm not sure I've got that exactly right either. Now, of course, I understand that elaborating on this proposal won't be easy, and that one reason to rely on agency discretion is that it obviates the need to provide direction. But still, I think that some criteria might be developed uh, that would help some of these agencies along in uh, making their cuts. The other thing I admire in the paper is the idea of codifying informal norms already in place. It's a great way to make sure that modifications in the system are, uh, in the author's words, calibrated accurately. And I think it also makes the proposal more acceptable politically. Uh, Jamie has pushed us to consider strategy. And I, I think this is a really wonderful way to begin. Uh, Artie and Becky's idea actually leads me to wonder whether there are other informal norms that might also lend themselves to codification. Uh, and the policy I'm thinking of in particular comes from another finding in the West Cone paper. Uh, it goes to universities' other role in all of this, uh, which is their role as consumers of intellectual property. Yet another reason why universities may have become so aggressive in acquiring patent rights is that they're worried about patents being asserted against them. Patents, remember, are not just about making money. They also have very deep significance when defending infringement actions. Lawsuits sometimes go away if the defendant has patents that can be asserted as counterclaims against the plaintiff. Now, interestingly, the concern about infringement actions has so far been more theoretical than real, and I think Harlan's remarks go to that too. Uh, but Wes Cohn found that university researchers do tend to infringe. However, they do it with immunity um, because patentees have been reluctant to assert their rights when the research is non-commercial. Now, that informal norm may continue to stand, but it could easily fall as well. The commercial, non-commercial distinction on which it relies is becoming as blurred as the old research use and use dichotomy. Think, for example, of someone doing basic breast cancer research, but on patients who have paid for tests that use the patented BRCA1 and BRCA2 technology. Moreover, as universities become more active patent litigants themselves, they look less like good guys. That means that it will become easier to sue them for infringement. And to be sure, the first to do so is going to suffer a reputational hit, but if that plaintiff wins, it'll become a model for others. To deal with the possibility that the informal infringement norm will also fall, I've been thinking about a defense aimed at freezing that. The defense would permit unauthorized use of patented materials by a university researcher so long as the researcher waived the right to obtain patent protection on the fruits of his or her work. The idea is modeled on an existing provision of the Patent Act, which exempts healthcare providers from liability when they utilize patented techniques to treat patients. Like that provision, this one targets particular users and thus avoids the need to characterize the invention as upstream or downstream or as having a research or an end use. By continuing to allow for patenting, the, pr the provision avoids TRIPS problems and it allows patents to be used for structural purposes, such as vehicles for disclosure and signals to potential investors and research partners. And of course, they're also useful for spurring commercial efforts by others. The main difference between current law and the provision I suggest is that mine would require a researcher who wants to use the defense to waive rights in her work. That waiver is not in the current statute, but it adds an important dimension here. It would contribute to the release of fundamental knowledge to the public domain. It might restore a bit of the Mertonian ethos that Stephen Berry has been lamenting. Uh, and it expresses two important quid pro quos. These are inherent in all of our discussions so far, but I think there's actually pedagogic value in making it explicit. First, universities will be giving a part of their income stream, yes, but they would get the benefits of saving money on royalties 
and getting that shield from infringement actions. Second, patentees would lose control over certain research opportunities. Yes, but in exchange, they've enjoyed the benefits of university scholarship in their areas of interest, a result akin to what Becky and Artie already portrayed the SNPs consortium as trying to accomplish, and also much like what Paul and Jerry are doing with their e-commons proposal. So I don't think that anything I'm suggesting here would undermine Artie and Becky's fine ideas, and indeed I hope they would take it as a friendly amendment. But thank you. I'd like to raise an issue that uh, I have not discussed yet on this panel, but I think is quite germane, especially to the idea of free journals. Um, it seems to me that in addition to being cited, researchers want to be able to do their research without fear of lawsuits, and uh, they want to be able to have other advantages they get from professional societies. If all the journals are made free, or if there are attempts made to circumvent the fees that professional societies charge for journals, which generally speaking I think are reasonable, certainly compared to what some of the for-profit publishers charge. Uh, in particular, ACM has a digital library. You pay one fee, you get access to everything online. Uh, but if this is all going to be circumvented, then societies will not have the income they need in order to do things such as, for example, s submit a declaration in the Felton case and do other work to try to, pr to s preserve the right of, of researchers to do their research. Yeah. Like uh, uh, I comment on that. Uh, it's, uh, it's an issue that, that uh, comes up, of course, all the time. And I think that nobody expects journals to uh, come cost-free. But uh, what we don't have yet and need badly is an analysis of uh, what mode of payment would uh, have the smallest transaction costs. Uh, should it be a subscription? Should it be payment by authors? Should it be uh, direct subsidy? Uh, th certainly, the when government supports research, uh, it takes on a responsibility to see that the results of that research are disseminated. So it's appropriate, for example, for a uh, grant to have in it enough money to, uh, to uh, uh, see that the results get published. If they're page charges, so be it. Uh, this is something that, that is, is not fully appreciated and understood, I think, by some of the program officers and, and uh, policy people in, in funding agencies. NIH is very good about it, but some of the others have budgets that just uh, force a kind of blindness to that issue. Uh, but there's no question that the professional societies have to find uh, modes of payment, and the, the, the logical way, as I said, is uh, are those modes that, that have the smallest transaction costs. Regarding commercial publishers, uh, there is nothing that says that commercial publishers have a natural right to publish scientific journals. Uh, unless they see a way of making a profit. If the journal is not going to make a profit, if it's not going to have enough subscribers who can pay the subscription price, then they shouldn't be in the business. They have no obligation to see that the journals continue. Uh, during the uh, 60s and 70s, it was easy to see why those were profitable. Today, there's nothing obvious about that anymore, and it would not surprise me one bit if we watch the disappearance in the next five years of a number of the small commercial journals, the highly specialized ones. Oh, I, we have an awful lot of questioners. Uh, Mel? Uh, thanks very much. I want to take, mention one small tactical point and then take a <coughs> step back to higher strategy. The tactical point is that one reason why the suits haven't happened is that the state immunity problem with the Seminole Indian case hasn't been solved yet. And a lot no. of the big players you would sue are state-run universities, not all of them, of course. But it does create a problem in the tactical plan field. The strategy point I want to make is that Professor Barry is perfectly right. What we have going on here, both in the science and the art and the democratic field, is a basic change in ethos. Um, I think that Philomar is right when he said that if you look at the what we call the Bill of Rights, a lot of these are strategies for training the population. 
The business of America is creating America, just the way the business of the university is training the students. And what my research has been showing is that the word progress in the constitutional clause, the intellectual property clause, means spread. It's a dissemination clause. Congress, on the contrary, is operating on Calvin Coolidge's aphorism that the business of America is business. And that's where the problem comes in. Now, as a tactical solution, where does this make sense? <coughs> I think that the question with the answer is Madison. We may not remember, but the big fight that the Federalists had was giving a federal government enough taxing power. And Madison made a perfect argument based on early Stuart history that now is not common knowledge to everyone. And what Madison put in the Federalist was that if you don't allow the government enough taxing power, the people will be subject to, quote, continual plunder, end of quote. And what he was talking about was the early Stuart system of funding what we call public activity privately. That was what the statute of monopoly was actually about. And what we've done is, by not reading history, we're going back to the same place. That, of course, is not very helpful at all with any of the tactical problems that we have. <laughs> Steve? Uh, yeah, I have one point, and maybe uh, tie it to what Barbara said. Uh, it is a generic feature of a lot of these problems that updates are a wonderful mechanism for price discrimination. The reason that Harlan's system works, I suspect, is that there isn't a big market for six-month-old journals. And the publisher can extract most of the rents, if not 95% of the rents he's going to get, by selling the current number to institutions and universities. And then you can get it into the public domain after six months. And there's a win-win here, because without the journal overhead and editing facilities in the first place, um, you, you uh, wouldn't have this wonderful resource that then gets dumped in the public domain. So there's a sense in which commercial forces can be made to push and grow the public domain and incidentally generate fees for ACM. I think part of the problem is the corruption of academic culture. I mean, the universities themselves, as I recall, lobby this. They work, the universities themselves lobby this. They, made, they, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. And in fact, they blocked attempts to try to amend part of by bill. So you, in developing a strategy, I think this the universities are part of the problem. And if we want to get them on the side of what I hope would be the traditional collective norm, it's now time for an effort on public change to reorient the university and university leaders. And we have to go after the leaders. It's not the people who are selling the licensing. It's clearly at the top, the edifice complex, the corporatization of all academic life, for the most part, which is really, in my field, for example, of telecommunications and media, has wiped out, for the most part, academic participation in the public policy. They're all working for the industry. Let me just respond briefly to the, the idea of public shaming. And I, I think that you're right in the sense that um, that university presidents and so forth basically don't really pay attention because they know what's going on. And so it's not as if they are uh, blissfully unaware in any way and therefore can wash their hands of it. But they don't really pay attention to the issue until there's some sort of public shaming going on. That's precisely actually what happened in the context of the University of Wisconsin patent. Um, all of a sudden, after President Bush issued his statement that federal funding would be restricted to existing lines, everyone became aware that, oh, by the way, University of Wisconsin basically has control of all of those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation miraculously decided that actually they were interested in devoting those lines to the public domain as much as possible. So now they're in a lawsuit with Giron to whom they've given all these rights saying that we didn't actually mean to give you all those rights. <laughs> so I think you're precisely right in that regard. I'm not sure that, I think I would agree more with Rochelle that I think there's a problem of benign neglect on the part of university presidents rather than affirmative collusion with tech, tech transfer people. I want to follow up on that point. Is it could, could you all describe a little more about who the institutional decision makers are within the universities that are pushing for commercialization? Because one thing that occurs is there are a bunch of lawyers in here who might be able to interface with the general counsel's office. And these technology transfer officers work for the general counsel, as I understand. 
And might we engage with them about sort of defining the goals of the client, or at least uh, it sounds like within the client, in, within the institutional client, there are different differences of opinion. Um. Actually, the tech transfer people are not part of the general counsel's office. They're separate office. Often they're not lawyers. They actually hate lawyers because they think lawyers impede technology transfer. So whenever I talk to transfer, transfer people, they sort of see me as the enemy. So I'm not sure the lawyers are necessarily the best emissaries to these folks. I think if we can, I, I, I do like this public shaming type of argument, if we can convince universities that it really is not um, going to add to their you know, public image to have uh, this kind of patenting, exclusive licensing going on repeatedly. Um, there will be much more pressure placed on these universities um, or, or tech transfer offices from above. Yeah, the other thing that's happened is the universities are getting very savvy about returning to faculty members more money than they used to. So right. faculty members have actually become a lot more interested in getting the money than they used to be. So it's by no means just the technology transfer offices. One more, Alex. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask a question of Marcy that you touched on in your paper, which is the, uh, the public storage agency. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't you point out that central agencies have, uh, are in a better position because they don't have a collective storage problem, and, but they've got a principal agent problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca uh, gave it the wonderful yes minister label. Okay? And, uh, Rochelle, right. That's Rochelle. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I'm wondering if you have any further thoughts on how to minimize the principal agent problem as a, 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 a byproduct, of an inevitable side effect of your uh, policy? No, I'm sorry. Could, could you clarify precisely who who the principal you're well, referring to? In is the agency? Uh huh. And the, the agent? The, the NIA and the agents mm -hmm. are the people, the bureaucrats in the NIA, to whom your proposal will give significant discretion. I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, so how to sort of control the behavior of these – Actually, and your, yours is actually a, a really excellent point because um, the people who would probably end up having the discretion, although we haven't clarified this as much as, as, as we should, I think should not be the tech transfer people in the agencies because actually within agencies there's the same sort of problem we see within universities. The tech transfer people within agencies and including the NIH, basically believe all patents are sacred. Um, so it would have to be some other group within NIH, not the tech transfer people. Now, then you'll, you'll it seems to me, you'll probably get um, intra-agency friction of some sort, as, as actually has occurred already in the context of what the NIH has done. The tech transfer people haven't been totally happy. But uh, basically what has happened in the context where it has worked is that either well, then Harold Varmus, who is the head of the NIH, basically told the tech transfer people, you have to do this, or Francis Collins, <coughs> who's still the head of the National Human Genome Research Institute um, within NIH, told the tech transfer people, this is what we're doing. So they almost went above the heads of the tech transfer people. Now, that's not a very institutional mechanism. I think we'd have to set up an office that would be institutionalized, that kind of um, uh, – th that have an interest in doing that on a regular basis, and then – Sure. No, I mean, no, there are public choice problems everywhere, obviously. You know, and the question is, where, where, what institution do you see the least public choice problems with? And, you know, as opposed to Congress, I think. You know? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, panel. Uh,